I'm Indy Nidell. And I'm Joachim from Sabaton, and this is Sabaton History. Now, we are standing in front of a bunker from the First World War, because we're going to be talking about one of the songs from your album, The Great War. And today we're going to be talking about the Red Baron. Now, everybody knows who the Red Baron is. No. This is Fort Douaumont, the symbol of Verdun, and for many, the physical symbol of World War I. But perhaps the most enduring symbol of the war is the Red Baron. People might not know the Kaiser, the battles, or anything about the war in general, but they still recognize the name, the Red Baron. Even over a hundred years after his death, he's still represented in books, movies, and songs. Manfred Albrecht Freiherr von Richthofen was born May the 2nd, 1892 in Silesia to Prussian nobility. His father was an officer of the Imperial German Army, and Manfred enrolled into Wallstadt Military School at age 11. He would rise to the rank of lieutenant in the 1st Uhlans, a prestigious cavalry regiment. However, when the war came, it became clear that cavalry would not play a major role on battlefields dominated by entrenched machine guns. To escape the monotony of guard duty in the trenches, von Richthofen looked to the skies, where the first reconnaissance planes flew, and he successfully applied for the air service in June 1915. He began his work as an observer in a two-seater on the Eastern Front, photographing Russian troops, and was then transferred to Belgium. Now, airplanes were still a new thing, and they evolved rapidly during the war. By late 1915, the days of unarmed reconnaissance planes were over and the single-seater fighter appeared over the battlefields, as did the first German flying aces, an ace being someone with five confirmed aerial kills. By early 1916, men like Max Immelmann and Oswald Belke made names for themselves as the Knights in the Skies, the first airmen to be awarded the Pour le Merite, Germany's highest military honor. They were huge stars. The public loved them and the enemy feared them. And of course, their image had a strong impact on young men like von Richthofen, who wanted to be just like them. This was the period of the Fokker Scourge, since thanks to Anthony Fokker's synchronization gear, German pilots were able to fire through their propellers and aim the gun by aiming the plane. And this changed how aerial warfare was conducted. Fighting in the sky reached a new level of intensity. By mid-1916, the Allies had caught up in the aerial arms race, and over the skies of Verdun and the Somme, vicious dogfights took place. Oswald Belke and German Chief of Field Aviation Major Hermann von der Liet Thompson had a new idea to maximize the effectiveness of the German Air Force, the Jagdstaffel, called Jasta for short. This combined several planes into a unit that fought together and attacked the enemy in concert. Belke would personally lead and train Jasta too, and he handpicked his pupils. One of them was Manfred von Richthofen, though it is unclear what Belke saw in von Richthofen, who had an unremarkable flying career so far and who had actually crashed the first time he had flown in a fighter plane. Yasta II, or Yasta Belki as it became known, fought in northern France near the Somme. The pilots could usually choose their own planes, at the time either Fokker D3 or Albatross D1 or the new D2. On September 17th, the Yasta was operational and Richthofen got his first official aerial victory. Belki had eight principles to guide his pilots. Dicta Belki, which you can read in the description. And he had a huge impact on German air strategy, but he met his fate October 28th. Nearly a month after that, Richthofen's legend began, when he shot down British ace Major Leno Hawker. Richthofen had embraced Belke's teachings and raked in victory after victory. Diving, whirling, accelerating, it all came naturally to him. On January 12, 1917, following his 17th victory, von Richthofen was awarded the Pour le Marite and given command of his own Yasta, Yasta 11. He brought in Dicta Belki and would lead the Yasta through personal example. Nowadays, Richthofen is often portrayed as the single hunter of the skies who flew mostly on his own in his bright red Fokker triplane. But in reality, his true merit was as commander of his Yasta. He was as skillful an organizer, teacher, and leader as he was a killer in the skies. Under his command, new aces emerged like Kurt Wolf, Werner Voss, and Manfred's own younger brother, Lothar von Richthofen. As spring arrived, 
They were equipped with a new Albatross D3, and what was known as Bloody April began. Over the skies of Alas, the Yasta went to work like predators stalking prey, fighting aggressively and systematically. It was truly a bloody April, as Yasta 11 alone scored 89 confirmed victories. Richthofen shot down 21 planes that month and had by now surpassed Bulky. The German press was ecstatic, and von Richthofen's fame rose to unprecedented levels. The newly promoted Rittmeister got worldwide attention. He was the Red Baron, the Petit Rouge, the Rote Kampflieger, because of the bright red of his planes. In the skies, there is no need for camouflage, and in battle, it paid to be recognized. Richthofen himself said, I make sure that my squadron sees me wherever I am. Like their commander, the men of Yasta 11 painted their planes in bright colors and distinct patterns. They were all differently colored. One was yellow with a black tail, another green and dark brown. One had blue stripes, another a, a checkered pattern on the tail. Standing in a row, they looked like brightly colored birds or butterflies. To friend and foe alike, the Yasta became known as Richthofen's traveling circus, as it was always sent to where the fighting was heaviest. They wanted to be seen by their enemies as well as by their comrades and the men on the ground. For the enemy, it should strike fear in their hearts. The famous red plane emerging from the clouds was, was terrifying for a new allied pilot. Friendly fire also happened a lot, especially in the bigger engagements. And the bright colors distinguished the Yasta from their enemies. Also, the men on the ground who watched cheering from their trenches could make out who made a kill. See, a victory in the sky had always to be confirmed in the German aviation service. If no one saw you do it, then it didn't count towards the tally. And since there was natural competition between the young men, this was pretty important. Richthofen was a caring mentor to his pups. And as the pilots returned after each mission, he would meet them with both praise and lessons on how they could hone their craft even further. He was beloved by many, but highly respected by all. However, the pilots under Richthofen's command were not invincible. The Allies had experienced veterans and aces of their own, and many German aces fell prey to Allied machines. As bloody April passed, the balance shifted once more towards the Allies, with their fighters like the SE-5 and the Bristol F-2B. To counter this and increase the effectiveness of the Jagdstaffel, they were combined to the even bigger Jagdgeschwader, hunting squadrons. The first squadron, consisting of Yasta 3, 4, 11, and 33, was placed under the command of the Red Baron. This was 50 to 60 planes that could quickly be transferred around the front. In Flanders, during the build-up for the Battle of Passchendaele in the summer of 1917, British artillery was giving the German infantry hell. It was directed by reconnaissance planes, accompanied by bombers and fighters who were strafing the Germans on every run. Jagdgeschwader 1 was sent for to try to gain local air superiority. On July 6th, von Richthofen led the mission and they encountered an enemy bomber squadron. As the Red Baron positioned himself behind a British bomber, something hit his plane, ricocheted off the frame and hit the Baron in the back of his head. Nearly unconscious and with blood pouring from the wound, he broke off the attack, but the hit temporarily blinded him. But he didn't panic and calmly turned off his engine. There was nothing he could do until the shock wore off and his sight returned. His plane had lost altitude by then, but two other pilots had guarded their commander from the enemy. Richtofen turned back on his engine and made his way back to the airfield. Who or what hit the Baron that day remains a mystery. Richthofen did not return to his men until mid-August. His head still bandaged, but from hospital, he had contacted high command about new planes. The British, with their new Sopwiths, had the upper hand, while the German manufacturers hadn't produced something new in months. On his return to the squadron, Antony Fokker himself was there to greet the Red Baron with the new Fokker triplanes, the Fokker V4 prototypes. Fokker, of course, used the meeting as a PR coup, filming the Red Baron in the new triplane, which is another reason why the triplane became so associated with the Red Baron. But Richthofen only scored a fraction of his total kills in the triplane. 
The plane's reception was mixed, however. It was way more maneuverable than the biplane, sure, but not much of an improvement in terms of speed. Von Richthofen wasn't too happy about the prototype, especially now that the enemy's advantage in numbers was growing more than ever. As 1918 began, German High Command wanted to see their star safe and sound, but the Red Baron could not be contained, and the German spring offensives needed their best pilots to succeed. In April 1918, Baron von Richthofen pushed his machine to the limits, scoring 12 victories in just two weeks. It was bloody April all over again. But the fighting and the head wound took their toll. Richthofen became exhausted and isolated himself more and more from his peers and his men. On the 21st, one day after he scored his 80th victory, von Richthofen flew out once again. At 10.30, his men engaged the Australian Flying Corps over Capi. Richthofen was seen chasing a camel scout. Uncharacteristically against his own teachings, von Richthofen pursued the fleeing scout along the Somme Valley, deep into enemy territory. Canadian ace Captain Arthur Roy Brown spotted Richthofen and dove behind him, firing a burst at the Baron's tail. Richthofen went down in a beet field, and the Red triplane came to a stop. The Red Baron, though, was dead, killed by a single bullet through the heart. Captain Brown is officially credited for bringing down Richthofen's plane, but it is more likely that the Baron was hit by fire from the ground as he was flying fairly low. But still to this day, there is a lot of controversy about the exact circumstances of his death. The news reached the Yasta after they had already begun searching for him, and German High Command even sent out an official request to Allied High Command inquiring about the fate of the Red Baron. Manfred von Richthofen, was buried by the Allies with full military honors, accompanied by an honor guard of officers from the Australian Flying Corps. His aircraft was taken apart for souvenirs, and even small pieces of the bright red canvas were valuable items. Some are still on display in museums in Britain, Australia, and Canada. But despite the death of a hero, the legend of the Red Baron was, and is still very much alive. And to this day, immortalized in songs like that by Sabaton. Okay, like I said, you guys do have a song about the Red Baron. It's on your new album, The Great War. Yes. Uh, well, tell us a bit about it. Well, it's a bit of a different animal, actually. This one is a very fast shuffle track, and it reminds me somehow about punk rock. Do the beat a bit. So there you go. Yeah. Okay, and why the Red Baron? What about the Red Baron was it that interests you? Oh, well, he's a legend. Yeah. And the funny thing is, everybody's heard about the Red Baron. Oh, yeah, sure. But nobody knows any details. It's like the legend has taken some life of its own. So why do you think, why do you think his myth, his legend has endured when, so, when people don't remember the Kaiser and things like that? Why him? Yeah, I have no idea, actually. I tried to figure that out when we were researching the album. Yeah? And I couldn't come to a you know, sensible answer. I really thought when I was a kid, and really thought up until I was working with the Great War, right? that it, you believe that myth that these things, that these are knights of the skies, that it was somehow honorable fighting and stuff. But even Red Baron himself would say, the best kill is when they don't see you coming. Yeah. That's not really honorable to walk up beside someone and shoot him in the head <laughs> with a machine gun. When you said like you've got the, the all sort of the punky shuffle beat, why would you pick that kind of beat to go with the Red Baron though? Well, I wish I could tell you all a really cool story now, but the truth is we wrote the song way before we knew uh, about which song was going to be picked for that topic. I knew it was going to be about the Great War. Yeah. And I just wanted to do something new. I wanted to do something different. And it's really straightforward, fast shuffle, Hammond organs, and you know, punk and you're gonna get a little snippet of it right here. I a hope so. Piece of it right here. And it's flying, and it's flying, the king of the sky, flying to fast and it's flying to high. The intro of the song is actually a uh, organ piece by yeah. Johann Sebastian Bach. And, and did you play it, or who played it? Uh, let's say I tried to play it. Uh, a computer helped me co to correct my mistakes. Oh, I'm there not, you go. You know, not, not too many people are good enough to play Johann Sebastian Bach's music on proper organ.
All right, everyone, that's it for today. And if you're curious of our new album, The Great War, for the patrons, there's a special edition, all right. If you can't support us on Patreon, that's all right, too. We love you anyway. But you can help us through subscribing, turning on notifications, commenting on these videos, start talking, have conversations there, for God's sake, and also spread it on other social media, all right? And if you want more of Sabaton's heavy metal music, we have plenty of it on the Sabaton official channel. And if you want more history, there's the Time Ghost and the World War II channel. So there's plenty for you to check out and plenty more to come. And if you want to see more Sabaton history stuff, you can click right there for more heavy metal.